Most of you have seen my earlier videos where um, I discussed about TLS and SSL handling in data power. Well, that video is still is still valid. However, these concepts have changed over a period of time in data power and in fact simplified for good. So in this video, I'm going to talk about how to do the SSL and TLS handling in newer versions of the data power appliance. So let's get started. There are two basic scenarios with data power as far as SSL and TLS are concerned. Data power can act as a server or data power can act as a client. On the left hand side, you see a client like Postman invokes a service on the data power, for example, a multi protocol gateway or web service proxy. This is an example where data power is acting as a server. On the right hand side, you see a scenario where data power is acting as a client. For example, you have a multi protocol gateway on data power <clears throat> and it is trying to connect with a backend service, maybe an MQ, an IIB service, anything. In this case, if it uses protocols like HTTPS, then this is a use case where data power is acting as a client. Once we understand these basic scenarios, we can now understand how these basic scenarios are supported in data power. So if you go back to old days, the story always started with SSL proxy profile. And then it branches into different sections. But here, the story no longer starts with SSL proxy profile. It's made simple. Simple fact is that if your data power is acting like a server, you got to create a TLS server profile. You can see on the left hand side that we have a TLS server profile screen. And here, primarily, you got to configure the identification credentials. If you are coming from Java world, configuring identification credential is logically equivalent to supplying a key store. You know that key store should contain a certificate and a matching private key. In a similar manner, when you configure the identification credential in data power, you got to supply a certificate and a matching private key. If data power is acting like a client, you got to configure TLS client profile in data power. Now the right hand side screenshot shows TLS client profile. Here, specifically, you got to configure the validation credential. Ignore the identification credential that is present there. Configure only the validation credential in most scenarios. Validation credential, once you configure that, you are essentially trusting the server certificate. And hence, the HTTPS or TLS connectivity will work. You got to remember that unlike your browser, data power does not trust any certificate by default. So no matter whether it is self-signed or whether it is signed by a CA, it will not be trusted in data power unless you explicitly trust it, trust it into the validation credential. Now, let us talk about a variation of what we have discussed so far. So I will go back here. These are basic scenarios, of course but there could be a variation of that. And that is mutual TLS or called MTLS. Here, you can see on the top left corner that data power is acting as a server. Client tries to connect with data power. At the same time, data power also demands a certificate from client in order to authenticate it. These type of scenarios are very common in B2B. And hence, you should be aware how to deal with that. In the bottom left corner, you see data power connecting with backend, data power acting as a client. Here, backend may demand certificate from data power in order to know which client is connecting to it. 
And this is also a scenario for mutual TLS. So for the top scenario where data power is acting like a server, you know that you will end up configuring a TLS server profile. Fine. But in this TLS server profile, you got to also configure the validation credential. But where are the validation credential in TLS server profile? If I go back to previous screen, on the left hand side you have TLS server profile and there is no validation credential here. Well, they will appear once at the bottom you enable the radio button called request client authentication. So when you turn them on, you will see that a validation credential section will come up and you will have to configure that. There you got to trust the certificate that is supposed to come from client side. If you don't trust that, this mutual TLS scenario will not work. At the bottom, you have data power connecting with backend. Here, if mutual TLS happens, you will end up configuring the identification credential in TLS client profile. If I go back to previous screen, you have a TLS client profile and I mentioned that you got to ignore the identification credential for the most cases. Well, that's true. But in case you are dealing with mutual TLS, you also need to configure identification credential. These credentials will ensure that at the time when backend server demands certificate from data power, the certificate associated in the identification credentials are sent as part of TLS handshake. So that is how you configure mutual TLS in data power. Here, you will have to remember key point. Again, if you are coming from Java world, then this is useful. Identification credential is logically equivalent to key store. And validation credential is logically equivalent to trust store. Having said that, here are few points that you should also remember. Data power does not accept the PFX or JKS key store format. So when I mention well, key store and trust store, do not take them literally. They are logical equivalents. Remember, PFX or JKS type of databases, key databases, are not acceptable on data power. Now, coming back to the next one, SNI. SNI stands for Server Naming Identification. There could be two scenarios. One, where data power is acting as a server and you are supposed to enable the SNI or data power is acting as a client and you are supposed to enable the SNI. If data power is acting as a server and you are supposed to enable the SNI, do not, and I'm repeating, do not configure the TLS server profile. It will not work. Rather, in place of TLS server profile, configure TLS SNI server profile. You can see a screenshot here. And here, you have a way to map the backend servers and their names. So that is how you configure a SNI profile when data power is supposed to act as a server. When data power is acting as a client, which is, which is um, in most cases, while configuring the TLS client profile, you will ensure that the SNI button is checked. As you can see at the bottom, it is checked by default. And use custom SNI host name setting if at all, um, you have to customize this setting. Remember that the SNI is enabled by default in, in, in a scenario where data power is acting as a client. These type of scenarios are very common when you are dealing with a Kubernetes cluster or you are dealing with OpenShift cluster. So if your backend application has recently upgraded to OCP, or Kubernetes-based cluster. Perhaps you are interacting with a load balancer and your actual servers are hidden behind those load balancers. So you got to enable this feature. In my experience, in most cases, when you are dealing with OCP, your connectivity will fail if this feature is not properly enabled or configured. 
So this is about enabling the SNI. Now, a couple of tips. I mentioned data power doesn't accept PFX or JKS key store formats. Hence, there is no use of a sp uh, spending time configuring data power except this. It won't. If you got PFX or JKS file, export certificates, private keys, upload them into cert or share cert folder into, into the data power. As far as possible, add only intermediary or root certs in the validation credential. Well, it is certainly possible to add leaf certificates in the validation credential. I would suggest that you do not do that. And if you end up doing that, you will have a good amount of dependency. And whenever the leaf certificate gets updated, you will have to update it into the data power. So a good amount of dependency. But it will certainly work. There is no technical constraint that you cannot upload a leaf cert in the data power. Yes, you can and it will work. SSL issues typically result in no HTTP response code for clients. This is for people who are trying to test services hosted on data power. Many of the time using clients like Postman or whatever your favorite client could be like curl, etc. When you invoke data power service, you will see no HTTP response code. Well, if you are certain that there is a network connectivity, then your next culprit is your SSL settings. Here I'm using the word SSL and TLS interchangeably. So in this case, you got to check your SSL settings. But how can you be sure that it is the SSL which is creating a problem? Well, system logs are the definitive way in which you can go and check whether you are getting any kind of TLS or SSL issues or not. On system logs, if you enable debug logging, you will be able to see SSL and TLS problems. Remember that probes are not very efficient in troubleshooting the TLS SSL connectivity issues. In many cases, they won't appear. And in cases where they appear, you won't be able to see much inside the probe. So probes are not a good way in which TLS troubleshooting should happen. In rare cases, you need to fall back on packet capture method. And you got to capture the packets. If you know how to deal with packets, you will be able to find out the TLS handshake over there and you should be able to prove or disprove certain hypotheses. Going to packet capture and troubleshooting for TLS connectivity is not unheard of. However, it is not normal. So your system logs are your best friend when you are dealing with TLS connectivity issue. That's all for this video. Thank you.